Will the revolution be funded? Last winter, I started to ask myself this question. Well, not that specifically, but I started to question whether or not we could actually make progress towards socialism while being funded by rich people. Hi, my name is Fox. I live in upstate New York and organize with my local tenants union. Most of the time we focus on local issues, but last year with a larger statewide housing justice coalition, we put pressure on the state to pass a bunch of new laws that protect tenants. Over the summer of 2019, New York State passed the biggest legislative upset in a generation, the Housing Stability and Tenant Protection Act. I don't mind. Hey everyone, we're over here in Albany fighting for tenants' rights. So come out and support us or and where you're at support us. Okay, cheer on. A large part of this victory was due to the work of nonprofit activist groups. Some of these groups were funded by the Ford Foundation, one of the world's richest foundations which claims a mission of advancing human welfare. But suddenly, after our landmark victory, much of that funding was withdrawn. But why? Were they too effective? How are these vital organizers going to continue to make strides towards housing justice without funding? Uh, professional organizers still have to eat? Is this the end of the housing justice movement in New York State? It got me asking big questions like, if this is how we build our base, does it all crumble once the capitalists realize we've become too effective? Is it okay for leftists to take money from the capitalist class in order to fund the revolution? Michael White is best known for billing himself as the co-creator of the 2011 Occupy Wall Street movement. My name is Michael White. I'm the co-creator of Occupy Wall Street and I live near New York City. When I was young, I decided that I was going to do this thing, which is that I was going to have the ultimate activist pedigree and just like, just do all of the insane things. So when I got back from Palestine, I was a big fan of this magazine called Adbusters. I worked my way up through making myself useful to the magazine. This is why I became a writer, is to work at Adbusters magazine, um, and became an editor and worked my way to the highest levels. And so what we did at Adbusters is we wrote a, um, what we called a tactical briefing, and we designed a poster. And the tactical briefing was basically just, it's just an email. You've got mail. As soon as we sent out the email, there was about something like 200 people in New York City who did think it was a great idea. And they were like these kind of outsider activists and they ended up being the ones who, you know, um, organized the first day of the protest. So there's still a lot of controversy around the creation of Occupy Wall Street. I still get people telling me, you didn't create Occupy Wall Street. And I'm like, okay, like, um, I did and I, I co-created in the sense with Kala because we were the first person who came up with the idea. We created the first Twitter account. I, fr I sent the first Twitter hashtag. We picked the date, the tactic, a lot of, we framed the whole protest, all this kind of stuff. But obviously, yes, I didn't even go to New York City. This is the very nature of contemporary social movements. I did not go to New York City. So you have people in New York City like, he didn't create the movement, he was never here. And I'm like, absolutely, you're absolutely right. I never went to New York City. But the idea and all of these, the parameters came from, from somewhere else. The Actors Graduate School is an online school taught for and by activists. It's a space for activists who want to take their social movement creation and their protest theory to the next level. This is one reason, amongst others, that White has gained a reputation on the left for being a grifter. My critique of Michael White's boutique activism still stands true given his recent exploration into the apparently revolutionary potential of the 1% at the World Economic Forum. Dot dot dot. Skeptical emoji. Michael White is a grifter. He claims to have invented the activism that was going on long before he turned up. Then he thinks he can teach us how to be activists. And now he's at Davos and releasing a cryptocurrency. Just fuck off. 
unbelievably cynical and self-promoting. Anyone who claims they co-founded a movement is already thinking about the movement not as a collective endeavor, but as some sort of branded organization to be milked for fame and fortune. I mean, look, I, I, there's all these unwritten rules, and we all experience them, and I don't think anyone's done a good job. Like, if I could, I would write an article where you just go and try to write down what these unwritten rules are. I mean, you discover them through stepping on them. Yeah. Um, another one is we don't go to elite spaces. Anyone, who, the only reason, so another, a huge, a huge critique that happened because I went to Davos was, the only reason he's going to Davos is because he's sold out. That's the only reason someone would go to Davos is to sell out. Like, and I'm like, really? That's the only reason? Like, I, I went to Davos and then I went to, the, to visit Extinction Rebellion. I actually am following this other trajectory, which is really another one, another one that I think is really hurtful is um, that no one should be able to live as an activist, like financially. Oh, yeah. Like if you yeah. make any money as an activist, you're obviously some sort of criminal. <laughs> or a grif or grifter, this word that they use, grifter. Oh, yeah. So the reason why I get invited, not a lot of corporations, but why some corporations are interested in these questions is because if you think about Occupy Wall Street from their perspective and these social movements, so within less than a month, 50% of Americans had heard about and were following the Occupy Wall Street movement. We know this from like a poll at the time. So that, from a marketing perspective, is priceless. Mm -hmm. So they, so they, yes, there's a tremendous amount of social pressure to, and within corporations and elsewhere, to make activism kind of a wing of marketing. And like, we want to do large scale mobilizations because it's a great way to do free marketing and about this brand that we're working on. And so we've seen a lot of like attempts, like Pepsi made that ad, everyone yeah, that hated it. I was All just thinking of, of that, right. the like ad in India where they're like, no, I'm going to drink right. Pepsi. Totally, yeah. <laughs> so there's like, that, that is a real, that is a real danger. Um, but I think that, so I mean, I don't think I have like a super good answer. So I'm here to kind of like negotiate that uneasy alliance between social activists and elites so that we can build an, a climate mobilization that could, you know, for example, plant one trillion trees. I, I, what I see happening is that activism is being integrated more deeply into the functioning of power and to elite circles, which is, I mean, which is why we're here. It's, mm. it's very strange that Occupy Wall Street would be here, you know, in the sense. But there, there is something about the capacity to mobilize people that elites are very curious about and very much want to learn about. And I think what I would say to youth is that they can't steal that power from us. They don't have the ability to steal it. They're going to have to work with us in this, in this endeavor. So it's, it's interesting. So I think it's obvious that Michael White would say the revolution can and should be funded. He makes it clear that activists have failed and the rich elites need us to mobilize large swaths of the population for their causes, which I guess he believes are just. I mean, I guess he thinks there are some good rich people out there. He also brings up the fact that people still need to work for a living so they can eat and survive. He's got a point there. I mean, don't organizers and activists deserve that just like everyone else? Are they supposed to starve for the cause? I certainly wouldn't want them to. That being said, White is criticized by some of the larger leftist platforms, and I'm starting to see where they're coming from. There's something very salesy about him that I can't quite put my finger on. Cooperation Jackson is a nonprofit in Jackson, Mississippi. They bill themselves as an emerging vehicle for sustainable community development, economic democracy, and community ownership. Their homepage touts that they are building a solidarity economy in Jackson, Mississippi, anchored by a network of cooperatives and worker owned, democratically self managed enterprises. The history of Cooperation Jackson is deep and layered, and very much revolves around the activism of Cali Akuno. From helping a radically progressive mayor, Shakwe Lumumba, win election in Jackson in Mississippi in 2014, to his Jackson Kush plan, which helped form the basis of what later became Cooperation Jackson, Cali Akuno is undoubtedly a socialist superstar activist. In 2010, Five years after Hurricane Katrina devastated the city of New Orleans, real estate developers teamed up with neoliberal government to exploit a vulnerable housing situation for their own gain. 
Kelly Akuno was one of the organizers fighting back against these powers that were trying to turn public housing into private investment. This is the Black Agenda Morning Shot from Monday, August 30th, 2010, being brought to you by Kali Akuno in New Orleans, Louisiana. In a statement issued after the demonstration, Survivors Village stated, as the rest of the city focused on the disaster of August 29th, 2005, as an event that happened in its past, residents of public housing and supporters stood in an all-day rain to protest the visit of President Obama to a neighborhood that has been purged of poor people, turned over to Warren Buffett and his investor friends, and is being promoted as the future of public housing around the country. The future that Obama came to support today is the total privatization of public housing throughout the country, which his administration is advancing with its promotion of the Petra Bill. As billionaire Warren Buffett stated on his visit to Columbia Park development in March, New Orleans is key by which he meant the total destruction of public housing, which he is promoting through his purpose-built communities organization, which he co-founded with Atlanta developer Tom Cousins, who administered the destruction of all of Atlanta's public housing earlier in the decade. However, activists in New Orleans have no intention on submitting to the designs of Petra or complying with Warren Buffett's dreams and going the way of Atlanta. They are mobilizing on the following demands. Now! The New Orleans activists were not able to stop Warren Buffett from growing his real estate empire, but I am happy that Akuno has been able to continue fighting for working class justice in the South. You don't know how many times I've talked to liberals and they will always ask that one annoying question. Oh, if socialism is so great, then show me a model that works. Uh, well, that's it. Cooperation Jackson is a model that works. I'd say these guys are actually doing it. They're doing a socialism. That's what I'd say to the, all the liberals out there. In fact, I already did. On the radio over the summer of 2019. There is a, a good model for this, for some of the stuff we're talking about. Yes, oh. that was what I was trying to ask. I'm like, <laughs> how, how help? How make capitalism go by? So look up a place called, <laughs> called Cooperation Jackson. Um, they're they're basically a socialist little socialist society. I, has has any kind of government agency tried to step in and stop them? I'm not, you know, I'm not sure about that. I I would love to learn more about them. But this like community, it sounds awesome. But the U.S. has a history of getting rid of awesome, like any kind of commune or anything. You can call right. it cults. I'm oh. not comparing this to Branch Davidianism, but they will send the ATF or whoever in there to kill you and. Nobody outside is going to know what went on in there. We'll just have whatever reports come out. And it's just like, it seems like every time something comes along that's different, even if it's good, eventually someone stamps it out. So, you know, I said it here. If something happens to this place, it was the government. Not to sound like a paranoid weirdo, but I am a paranoid weirdo, and it's really not that unheard of. So, I mean, yeah, they'll just, you know, if you guys, like, hear anything about this place, you know, just... Uh, keep your ears peeled. Yeah, well, we should, there should be more of them, you know, like we should see them as a model. We should make so and... many more they can't be stamped out. Exactly. Yes, and so how huh. to support them too as well. I yeah. hope it's safe that you're able to mention them on the air. Yeah, uh, Beetle and Freedom Walker bring up a, a good point. If Cooperation Jackson is a threat to the capitalist class, they might be in real danger. Folks who have a history of challenging capitalism usually end up dead, especially if they're black. Long live the spirit of resistance. It's 5.27 p.m. State police helicopter drops and there is the explosion. Morning. What you are looking at now is a live picture of the water cannons pouring high-pressured streams of water onto the top of the move house. It's hard to say from where I sit, but it doesn't seem like Cooperation Jackson is in any immediate danger with regards to state-sanctioned violence. At least, I hope. And more importantly, I think if we were to ask them if the revolution should be funded, 
they would say the opposite of Michael White, right? Fuck capitalism. We don't need your money. We the people are gonna make this happen. Our commitment should be to eliminate capitalism because it is not a system that's benefiting humanity. Maybe a small part of humanity, but not the not most of us in the majority. So it's in that context that I challenge that we say we should build movements, and we're not and they're not giving us a gift because the wealth that they're dis distributing comes from the workers. So we are challenging to to get back a greater share of the, of the wealth that um, we create as working class people, and you know it's largely appropriated um, by the capitalist class and its state. Agencies. So it's in that context where I said we will challenge them, but it's going to be we must have movements that's big enough to challenge at you know where they will send resources our way, and we're not grateful for it because it's our money. It's like Bill Gates giving a billion dollar. We're not grateful to Bill Gates. That's money that they they stole from the working class. So they're barely giving us something so you can look good in the eyes of the working class. We are not grateful for that. We'll take it, and at the same time we'll string him up the next day. Yeah. Okay, okay, that's still fucking badass as hell. Let's take those fuckers' money because they took it from us to begin with. Take that money, then turn around and string them up the next day. Maybe that's what we need to remember as leftists, as activists, as organizers. We just need to take the money because money is a resource from the capitalists, funnel it into our efforts, and then turn around and... Am right, comrade? Peter Buffett is the son of the world's third richest man, Warren Buffett. He's an Emmy Award winning musician. His music absolutely slaps. He's woke as fuck. He wears his pussy hat with pride and vigor. He's the co-founder of the Novo Foundation, one of the world's largest and most influential charitable foundations. But more than anything, he's famous for writing a 2013 op-ed to the New York Times criticizing the charitable industrial complex. What to make of the following? Philanthropy is enjoying a heyday. The nonprofit sector has never given away more, 316 billion in 2012, according to the Urban Institute. Meanwhile, governments in crisis and basic human services are being cut. Grid TV guest Peter Buffett thinks a lot about these topics. He's a musician and composer, but yes, he's also the son of Warren Buffett. With his wife, he heads up a foundation. But in July, he penned an op-ed with the provocative title, The Charitable Industrial Complex. And he wrote, as more lives and communities are destroyed by the system that creates vast amounts of wealth for the few, the more heroic it sounds to give back. It's what I would call conscience laundering. So I've called it philanthro-feudalism, but I like this uh, <laughs> charitable industrial complex. Thank what you. do you mean by it? <laughs> well, uh, you know, it's a uh, system like so many others that have sort of, uh, I guess it's grown too big for its britches or something. <laughs> and I will say britches because it's mostly men. Um, but uh, it, it really seems like it's sort of folding in on itself and, you know, keeping itself alive as opposed to trying to put itself out of business. Dang, for a billionaire, this guy seems pretty woke. If the revolution is going to be funded, this is the guy to do it. This is the benevolent billionaire that we as leftists need. The dude fucking rocks. I mean, what do you think, Peter? What could possibly be the drawbacks? How could funding the socialist revolution be considered wrong? Well, you know, I, I, I sort of hate to say it's wrong, misguided, you know, off the tracks a little, but not because there aren't well-meaning people, but it's because you get caught up. You know, one thing, for instance, is I say that when you have a billion dollar foundation, you're better looking, your jokes are funnier. <laughs> so you start to get into this funhouse mirror world and you can't get to the truth as easily because the money creates a dynamic that is really disastrous for real learning. Wow, yeah, that's fucked up. But there must be a lot of actual good happening and the people in it still have the best of intentions. 
these are well-meaning people, right? There's plenty of good happening and certainly plenty of well-meaning people, but as it gets into larger sums, uh, bigger egos, <laughs> uh, bigger rooms with more people in them, uh, it starts to disconnect itself, I think, from the very issues it's, it's, it's supposedly solving or helping or whatever. Huh. So what happens when it becomes large sums of money? You've got people with vast amounts of money controlling government ultimately too. But didn't we create a system when we created graduated income tax? And you have governments that are elected with accountability to the people that decide how some of this money is spent. The philanthropists today want to not pay taxes, right. and shelter their money, but then well, control government, as Go you said, and through campaign yeah, contributions. Yeah, yeah, and then play with it with charitable contributions. And yeah, the whole, it, um, it's a mess. I mean, surely the fact that he's saying this means he's aware of the problems, so he's figured out a way around them, right? Hey, I was just doing some research and found out some interesting data. You know Peter Buffett's Novo Foundation? Well, they spent over $100 million from 2013 to 2018 in and around Kingston, New York. Over $60 million of that was in 2018 alone. Of all the small towns in the country, there are only two others where one philanthropist or foundation has given so much. They are Peter Buffett and the Novo Foundation in Kingston, $62 million, the Walton family, aka Walmart, in Bentonville, Arkansas, also $62 million, and Howard Buffett in Decatur, Illinois, $45 million. Fuck, that's a lot of money, Jesus. Good news though, our friends at Cooperation Jackson say that Kingston is doing awesome things just like they are. This place Kingston sounds like a leftist paradise. I wish I lived there. Oh wait a minute, but I do live here. In 2018, Ulster County recorded its highest ever number of evictions, and Kingston had the highest eviction rate in New York State. The county also has triple the Airbnb activity of any other county north of New York City. The county has the sixth most unaffordable market for tenants in New York State. Since 2000, the median rent has gone up by 50%, while median wages have remained the same. The county cop in charge of evictions openly says he moved here because there are no tenant protections. A decade ago, opposing affordable housing was a bipartisan issue. Today, some of the same people have moved on to blocking rent control. Local politicians give tax breaks and sell public assets to private developers and then do business with them after they leave office. Andrew Cuomo, the local government, and New York City developers are openly mining the city's qualities to spur development, tech jobs, and revitalization. It is a new city with a new attitude and a new trajectory. It's a totally changed place. It can be done. You are doing. Evidentiary note. Young friend of mine, millennial, was in California, an artist, calls me up and moving back to New York. Where are you going? Kingston. I said, really? She said, yeah, I've been there. It's very cool. I said, see, I know cool. <laughs> Howard does not know cool. The same problems exist in the other two towns that are receiving the most concentrated philanthropy. The influx of charitable investment leads to capital improvement, which leads to gentrification. And without strong tenant protections, results in the displacement of the existing community. Okay, so let's take a closer look at this article titled, The U.S. City Preparing Itself for the Collapse of Capitalism. From a festival that helps artists trade work for healthcare to a regional microcurrency, Kingston is trying to build an inclusive and self-sufficient local ecosystem. Much of this article revolves around an annual event called the 
zero plus uh, o o plus o o positive festival. The author, a co-founder of the festival, says we came up with a plan, drawing on the age-old system of barter. We figured out a way to trade the art of medicine for the medicine of art. Hmm. Artists bartering for healthcare? Sounds pretty damn leftist if you ask me. Let's see what this guy has to say about that. We've, yeah. we've got the motivation, but interestingly, this started before the Affordable Care Act. This is here now because complete wellness isn't just having health insurance. It's about community reassurance and how we are there for each other. And it's like health assurance is what we try to try to really go after and how can we empower communities to take control of their well-being and that might mean putting a mural up of you know an indigenous woman who paints the mural of an indigenous woman on the side of a building in kingston so we should be reminded of what's going on so that's really important and those those murals that are behind here and the seven that are going up right now around kingston and my hat is off to the art witches of our art program, Kimberly and Denise, for curating it so well. There are now 29 murals here in Kingston, and they don't go anywhere. You know, they stay. And we're reminded every day that we put murals in neighborhoods of people that look like people in each neighborhood, so we can begin to break down the, the barriers between our neighborhoods and between each other. Yeah, and we need that so bad right now, so badly. So thank you. I don't, I don't want to take any more time. Wait, is that Amanda Palmer? The lady who wanted to pay musicians with beer and hugs? Anyways, back to the article. This article highlights eight different initiatives that support the main thesis of the article. That Kingston, New York is emerging as a left-leaning, self-sufficient community. But what if we take a closer look at these initiatives and how much funding each one has received from Buffett's Novo Foundation? A more accurate title for this article would be How a Billionaire is Ushering in a New Era of Philanthrofeudalism. But Peter's financial entanglements are conveniently left out. We're left with the impression that these initiatives are just happening organically. I don't want to claim that I know why this article was shared as widely as it was, but I think people have an idea that capitalism is fucked at this point. I think if people knew the context that all this cool shit is happening because of a billionaire philanthropist, it probably wouldn't have sparked reactions such as... I'm heartened to see places and people that are actively imagining and developing alternatives to our current economy and planning for the inevitable changes that we are facing. And I'm posting this again because I feel that this article illustrates a hopeful example of how we can transform our communities into joyful places that sustain life and a world beyond capitalism. Now that's a grassroots effort to cure what ails us, economically, politically, culturally, and medically. Wow, an idea for our times. Whoa, this place looks lit. Damn, that makes me kind of sad that Cooperation Jackson posted that article. It feels like this article was just spun up as propaganda for the Novo Foundation to promote all of their organizations and this event that they're doing here in Kingston. Yo, Kali Akuno is going to be here in Kingston headlining this event. What are the odds? That is so cool. Man, if he only knew the truth about Kingston. Me and my comrades reacted pretty badly to the Guardian article that they shared on Facebook. I'm gonna reach out to them and let them know why we reacted that way. Hey y'all. I know a few of us Kingston locals blew up your post. There are strong feelings here about how O Positive, amongst many other nonprofits, are screwing over the city's working class population. I'm a longtime follower of what y'all have been doing. I've mentioned CJ many times when people ask me how a socialist model can work in real life. Like I mentioned, I helped start Kingston Tenants Union and our local DSA chapter. 
Many of us who are fighting for housing justice slash social justice see that Guardian article as a huge slap in the face. I'd be happy to talk to anyone if you want more info on all this. In solidarity, Fox. Oh, well, that's a bummer that they didn't respond. Oh well. Man, that whole thing with Cooperation Jackson and the Novo organizations was so weird. Just for shits and giggles, I'm gonna Google something. Kind of government agency tried to step in and stop them. I'm not, you know, I'm not sure about that. I hope yeah. it's safe that you're able to mention them on the air. It's not a radio station. It's something else. It's about these other ways it, it can put its tentacles. Put its tentacles. Put its tentacles into the community and and be an amplifier of what's really already happening. My name is Michael White. I am was the co-creator of Occupy Wall Street. Um, and now I live in Kingston. 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 The longer I sit with this question, the more I firmly establish myself in the no camp. And I think it boils down to two reasons. Reason number one clout sharks and elite capture. In the case of Michael White, it's pretty obvious to see how money attracts opportunists, often in the form of clout sharking. House clout, clout, clout sharks, man, this clout shit is funny. People who are out for social capital gain, or it usually happens by way of elite capture. The concept of elite capture originated in the study of developing countries to describe the way socially advantaged people tend to gain control over financial benefits meant for everyone, especially foreign aid. But the concept has also been applied more generally to describe how political projects can be hijacked in principle or in effect by the well-positioned and resourced, as Yang's step up demand exemplifies. The idea also helps explain how public resources such as knowledge, attention, and values get distorted and distributed by our power structures. And it is precisely what stands between us and Smith's urgent vision of coalition politics. The individualism inherent in Michael White's body of work is palatable. He brags about being invited to elite spaces. He runs an activist graduate school. He's literally profiting off of the professionalization of activism. I don't know if a more neoliberal concept exists. Reason two, undermining the actual movement. Even if Cooperation Jackson is the perfect socialist model, they're inherently not. It doesn't actually work. It relies on capitalism. It's crushing and unfortunate. I wanted so badly for it to be true, just like many of my comrades. It would feel so good to have a W. And you could argue that sometimes we just need some inspiration, some hope, but if we're being lied to, if we're not being told how all this works, we'll be left with more despair after the feel-good drug wears off. Some folks on the left that I've talked to will make the argument in favor of funding, saying that we can take the money as a resource from elites, but then turn around and cut ties with them as soon as we've secured the funding. This sounds ideal in theory, but in practice, I don't think I've ever seen an example of this working. It's usually the other way around. 
Elites pull funding once the nonprofit becomes not only effective, but dependent. The Novo Foundation has quite effectively annihilated any shred of working class solidarity here in Kingston, New York. They've done so via tactics that have already been well documented by a group called Insight in their anthology called The Revolution Will Not Be Funded Beyond the Nonprofit Industrial Complex. Insight defines the nonprofit industrial complex as a system of relationships between the state, the owning class, foundations, and nonprofits. This system of relationships results in the surveillance, control, derailment, and everyday management of political movements. They go on to say that the state uses nonprofits to monitor and control social justice movements. The station is really, I mean, I really do say it's a social justice organization disguised as a radio station <laughs> because we aren't just a radio station in the sense that we are out in the community uh, supporting block parties, live streaming from City Hall, uh, going to just about every event. Uh, but it really saw, you know, in again a small community specifically, um, we could cover essentially the whole thing and mm. become the station, which we have in a very short time. Divert public monies into private hands through foundations. In 2017, Kingston was awarded a $10 million downtown revitalization grant. Eight of the 19 committee members that were hand-selected to decide how the money was spent were from Novo-funded nonprofits, and even included Peter himself. Manage and control dissent in order to make the world safe for capitalism. As our uh, footprint in terms of the consciousness of the city grows, there'll be more opportunity for that because more people will go, oh, hey, this is a place where we really could get into some things uh, and get some feedback. And, and uh, you know, the challenge is finding uh, alternative voices that don't just want to push back against yeah. other voices, but actually want to contribute. And, and yeah, you, you've described it before yeah. in terms of uh, uh, being constructive redirect activist energies into career-based modes of organizing instead of mass-based organizing capable of actually transforming society. In a 2017 article by Akinyele Umoja for the National Coordinating Committee of the New African People's Organization, Umoja writes, Cooperation Jackson is directed by Kali Akuno, who terminated his membership to both New African People's Organization and Malcolm X grassroots movement the day prior to the victory of Shakwe Antar as mayor and consequently announced that Cooperation Jackson would no longer be affiliated with our organization. While it was intended to build worker-owned and managed cooperatives and organize the black working class in Jackson, Cooperation Jackson has not been able to develop a base of support among indigenous black people in Jackson particularly black workers. This group has so far functioned merely as a nonprofit to raise funds which seem to be dedicated primarily to employ a small clique of mostly transplants to Jackson. This group has failed to mobilize and organize black workers in a city which is 80% black and working class. While its leadership has participated in the ultra-left attacks on the Lumumba administration and the political work of the New African People's Organization slash Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, Cooperation Jackson has relied on the legacy and used the name and image of Baba Shakwe and the Lumumba family and the history of the New African People's Organization slash Malcolm X Grassroots Movement organizing in Jackson to gain and maintain support locally, nationally, and internationally. Moja is not alone in this sentiment. In a doctoral dissertation titled Worker-Owned Cooperatives as Urban Economic Development by a University of Louisville student named Nick Condor, a local community member alluded to an undercurrent of concerns about Cooperation Jackson. I don't see a lot of money going into the hands of the people from Jackson. I see a lot of people from out of town who are able to make a pretty decent living, 
but in reality, we are paying ourselves and buying up a bunch of land, and we have two people out of ten that are from here. I don't see a whole lot of money going back into the community. One respondent stated that the project felt like a lab experiment, where people moved from out of state to test their economic approach on an unsuspecting community of people desperate for opportunities. It's insulting when you come in here and you try to force a philosophy on someone without becoming part of the fabric of the community. Allow corporations to mask their exploitative and colonial work practices through philanthropic work. Encourage social movements to model themselves after capitalist structures rather than to challenge them. During the pandemic, Novo's gaggle of nonprofits coalesced to form something they call the Community Fund, which amounted to a means tested $500 that you need your landlord to write a permission slip for. Based on Insight's work, I can say no, the revolution will not be funded. Revolutionary and grassroots groups might work in coalition with nonprofits on specific things, but we need to organize in ways that aren't reliant on billionaires to write checks. I'm pretty sure that Peter Buffett doesn't want to fund the revolution either. If I were to guess, I'd say that Peter is a lot like his dad in that he's always trying to read the tea leaves and hedge his bets. Insight's book came out before Peter wielded the power of a billion dollar foundation it wasn't until 2006, a year after the book came out, that Peter received a billion dollar commitment in the form of Berkshire Hathaway stocks from his dad. In his big 2013 op-ed about the charitable industrial complex, he says that he's not really calling for the end of capitalism, he's calling for humanism. Writer Mark Rahman made one of the only left critiques of the article at the time saying, the need for socialism is the only logical conclusion one can draw from the reality of capitalism. Peter Buffett offers no real coherent answer. He is still defending a system which has inequality built into its DNA. Given his upbringing and resulting consciousness, he just can't quite make the break. I used to see Cooperation Jackson as a socialist model. But I also had no idea they were being funded by the same philanthropist that has this tight grip on my very own hometown. Cooperation Jackson, that Guardian article, and things like it are used as inspiration by many of us who dream of a post-capitalist world. They are presented as things that just happen, and the fact that a billionaire is funding them is conveniently omitted. This makes them nothing but a mirage. These things aren't moving us towards socialism or justice. They've got all the optics of an egalitarian society without actually being one. Instead, what we're left with, as Peter says himself, is a funhouse mirror. Now one thing, for instance, is I say that when you have a billion dollar foundation, you're better looking, your jokes are funnier, you're invited ever. So you start to get into this funhouse mirror world. I mean, I, I tell people that, you know, once you have a billion dollar foundation, your jokes are funnier, you're better mm. looking, <laughs> all these magical things happen. And it's funny, you know, when you have a big foundation like that. You... And I always like to point out that it's amazing when you have a billion dollar foundation. I joke about the fact that, that when you have a billion dollar foundation, you're better, better looking, looking and you're funny. And your jokes, <laughs> your jokes, jokes are funnier. Are funnier. Oh, you're, uh, but, it's um, crazy what happens. You know, I mean, when you have a big foundation, you're better, better looking and you're funnier and you're all those yeah. things. It's amazing when you have a billion dollar foundation, though, you're, you're funnier, you're better <laughs> looking. <laughs> all these wonderful, amazing things happen. <laughs>